Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, we attend Chocobo University and learn our ABCs and our work, work, works. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined as I am always joined by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how's it going? It's going great, Patrick. Can I ask you a quick question? You have to. Okay, so uh, listeners may or may not know that you have a very well-maintained mustache. Thank Okay. And I <laughs> would love to know how often do you shave? What sort of maintenance does it take? To keep this mustache in check. Now, this is interesting because I just recently... This is not interesting. I'm so sorry. I'm going to pose it as though it's interesting. I just bought a new razor. I, I had ordered one from from Wall, uh, the, the company Wall, W-H, okay. W-A-H-L. Um, it arrived. It was missing a power button. I sent it back. <laughs> I went to Best Buy and bought an, another one, which was also $30 cheaper, by the way. I don't know what's going on. But Are this, you an electric razor man? Uh, yes, I am an electric razor man. I am razor an electric man. razor man as, as well. But the thing is, I, I'm sort of a combination man. Because okay. uh, when I get, yeah, when I get down to my, you know, so I've, I've got a, a mustache and uh, sort of like stubble, basically, uh-huh. right? Yes. But the stubble is not universal stubble around my face because like down in my neck, it gets a little too gross if I don't like shave it away. And also I have odd hairs that appear way too high up in my cheeks. Could you grow a full beard if you wanted to grow a full beard? Because some like yeah, do you know I, what I mean I like think it I all could, it all yes. connects or is it do you have like patchy? No, it it, it does all. I mean, it, it mostly connects except for these rogue like honest to god like up on my cheekbones. I get those too. Yeah, and it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's just like one or two lone little hairs. Yes, so sometimes yeah. like, oh, is that like a loose hair, like an eyelash that's on my cheek? No, no it's growing it's out of my face. Anchored to the skin. Uh, Disgusting. Look. As we as we yes. discussed previously, we're body negative. We're, we're All body bodies negative. are bad. <laughs> All bodies are bad. Sorry about it. Uh, no, but I mean, I I go uh, so I use both the electric razor and just straight scissors on on my mustache. Wow, like fabric scissors? No, they're hair scissors. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Do th- does my mustache strike you as fabric? You think it's felt? Do you think I put a little bit of felt on my face? No, I just you know people do crazy things. Speaking of crazy things that people do, my copy of Sonic Forces for the Nintendo Switch. Would you like to borrow it? You can. All you gotta do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. Give us a mailing address so we can send you my copy of Sonic Forces or my copy of Untitled Goose Game. There's no way to know which one you're gonna get. Um, did I say you send? Uh, you, I uh, don't think you I did. D- I don't know what I said. Yeah. <laughs> you need to give us a mailing address so we can send you my copy of the of either of those games. Um, uh, you play it for as long as you want. You don't pay for postage. Either way, you send it back. It's the perfect borrowing program, even when my explanation of the program is less than perfect, Well, which I prog- recognize it was. You are an imperfect vessel in which to work the miracle of the perfect program. Truly, my imperfection, imperfections only serve to illuminate the perfections of the program. Yes, yes. it is... Uh, our imperfections are a mirror to the perfections of the Sonic Forces borrowing program. That's right. Are there, like, um, not to derail this, but we say that there are no rules yeah. on the Sonic Forces borrowing program, and that is 100% true. Can I ask, though, is that only true when it is in the possession of somebody, or, like, if somebody tries to email in and say, like, I want Sonic Forces, or I want... Untitled Goose Game, and I know that it'll be ignored, right? But is that against the rules, or are there no rules to any part of there the program? There are no rules to any part of it. You can request whatever you want, but the fates are what the fates are. You get the game, you get. You would think that you know what, like five hundred and like six hundred some odd no, 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 no. episodes it's, into it's this perfect. show. You would think that this far into the show that we would have have illuminated already mm. every point that there is to point. But this just shows that the Sonic Forces borrowing program is. And is vast. Right. And it, endless. it is an enigma that reveals itself to us over the course of time. Uh, and, and, and to you, the listener, I'm glad that we're all on this journey together. Another thing you can do is you can leave us a five star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere that you get your podcast. Patrick and I appreciate it so much. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it you know as the show is starting to go independent it this is a great way for people to find the show who knows the mysterious algorithms and the way that they work but it is a known factor at least everybody's on board with repeating this fact that's right that you know the more reviews you have the better the reviews the higher you are in the ranking and we're it's all about engagement mark exactly so we really appreciate it when people leave reviews if you leave us a review on the us apple podcast store we can see it and we'll give you a shout out on the show if you leave us a review anywhere else we can't see it but we would still love to give you a shout out so hit us up on twitter send us an email let us know uh also another thing you can do is you can join our discord we are on there we're having great conversations about nintendo stuff and not nintendo stuff people were sharing pet photos the other day oh it's, it it's was so good it was the best i saw a rabbit mark i saw a rabbit in that thread it was great um so either email us or hit us up on twitter get in the discord mark we can't really screw around anymore we've got a long topic today we are discussing the abcs of square enix <laughs> And Mark, why would we do this? Why why is this a thing that we're talking about now? I I, I have a theory. Okay. Um, so we were talking about Square Enix recently in the context of uh, they sold off some of their or they sold off their their Western studios, um, Eidos, uh, Eidos Montreal and Square Enix Montreal. I think are are the the, the three studios and a lot of the um, sort of attendant IP that were with those studios. Um, and some of the sort of background thinking there is like, are they uh, positioning themselves to be purchased by another entity. Uh, and there's no way that entity would be Nintendo. Um, so like, I don't, I don't know. Like I personally felt a little bit of like, Oh no. What if we as Nintendo fans lose the square Enix library mm, or like the mm-hmm. magic of square Enix bringing games to Nintendo? Yeah. I mean, it feels like we're in this time where it, it could absolutely happen someday. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll always have the memories. We will, in fact, always have the memories, and we'll have this list of ABCs of now. What the way that I I approached this mm-hmm. um, was, I kept everything on the table that was Square Enix and in some way related to Nintendo, um, which for me just meant like, does it appear on a N- Nintendo platform? Um, and I mostly kind of steered away from the later Final Fantasy stuff, like seven, eight, and nine, which I know obviously are are on Switch now, but. Um, you know, weren't originally. And for me, Final Fantasy VII is like the original sin of like the, or like the, it's the first fissure in the Nintendo Square Enix relationship. So I, I as much as I could have done an ABCs of Final Fantasy VII, um, I tried not to do that. Yeah, I did not take that approach. So pretty much mm. anything that is Square Enix is was fair game for my list. Uh-huh. I think... General, well, actually, that may or may not end up being true. I was going to say that everything on my list ha- at some point ended up on a Nintendo console. That I actually don't think that that's true. Mm. But um, are we talking about the bouncer here later? <laughs> we could be. <laughs> we could be. Uh, we'll find I, out soon. <laughs> yeah. But so no. So for me, it is not all Nintendo related. I think the majority of it is, but there are a few items on this list that I don't think have ever graced a Nintendo console. Um, well, from there, we are going to start with our letter A, our A of uh, Square Enix. Um, I'll go first. Great. Um, so I kind of, this. I start, I'm starting off going with an obscure thing. I, it's a team, a team of characters in Super Mario RPG referred to as the Axum Rangers. Uh, the Axum Rangers are, a, they're like mini boss characters that uh, you fight a couple different types uh, times throughout the game. And they're sort of a pastiche of um, like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and like Voltron kind of. Um, they're all different colors. Uh, and they each, there, there are five of them. There's a red one, a pink one, a blue one, a black one, and another color one, yellow. Did I say yellow? I don't think so. I don't, well, okay, great. Um, and each of them like fills the same role as one of the five party members in, um, uh, Super Mario RPG. So like, you know, there's like the all around, like well-rounded, uh, Mario type one. There's the, uh, Bowser sort of like tank one. Um, and they're just a, a cool, fun set of characters that uh, really don't feel like Mario, and they don't feel like Square Enix. Um, but they're in this game, which is presumably both, 
Do you know what I mean? I do. I actually feel like there's a lot of Super Mario RPG that doesn't fit comfortably in either. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's Super Mario RPG, I think, is kind of its own incredibly unique project yeah. that I've got to give a go back and replay at some you point. You gotta. Yeah, it's been a very long time. Yeah. Um, but so that's my A, the Axum Rangers. So my A is uh, airships. Ooh, what a good A. So a, a big part of Final Fantasy appear in, I think, every Final Fantasy game. Yeah, I think so. Airships usually come towards like the last half or you know third of the game when the worlds generally really open up. And it's a way for your characters to explore the world map. I have a couple of favorites. Um, Prima Vista from Final Fantasy IX. It's like... It's, in the game for not very long. It's at the very beginning. It's kind of where, like, the... the um, it's the one that gets is, like, shot theater. down yeah, at exactly. the beginning. Yeah. But the interiors of that and are... It's just so cozy, and I... I Well, it's it's one of the times that the, the airship is actually, like, characterized as something more than just, like, the... Where it's not like a military vehicle. Um, it serves... Because it's, it, it's a theater troops um, uh, airship, yeah, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's how weird, they like, get Like, traveling, around. yes. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, and... I, there are, in reviewing this list after I completed it, I was like, oh, there's, uh, I'm kind of showing that I love Final Fantasy IX because there's, uh, Final Fantasy IX makes a number of appearances. But another one that I think is kind of cool and uh, fits this same sort of thing that you were saying where um, uh, it's a little different than the other airships and games is uh, Balam Garden. And not even from Final Fantasy VIII. And oh, okay. I don't even know if it really counts as an airship. I don't think it's like... But it is, you don't real, for the beginning of the game, you don't realize that like the school, like the place you're at is right. an airship. But at some point of the game, it just like takes off and you can, you use it to travel around the world. So that's just another cool. Do you, do you have an airship that comes to mind that you particularly like? Yes. So uh, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the second airship in Final Fantasy VI. Um, because is they're... it Blackjack, the casino one? So is is Blackjack the first one? Because because there are two airships. There's there's the one that you uh that you get initially um that is belongs to Setzer. Um, oh, that's Blackjack, and that's Blackjack. Okay. So I, I think it's the Falcon is 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 the second one um that like belonged to his uh like girlfriend many you know years ago and before the world ended um and you end up like visiting the like they they had some like epic race and she was like lost um and in the world of ruin ruin you come upon sets are like rediscovering this airship um so like there's so much of um this like totally frivolous characters uh like real loss and pain tied to it that i just love and just love getting that airship back um and is one of the parts of you know, rebuilding the world after the end of the world that feels so satisfying and so fun. Um, so, I, I mean, I also love the high wind um, from Final mm. Fantasy VII. Uh, I uh, also really like the uh, all of the airships in Final Fantasy IV. Um, I'm a sucker for airships, totally. Is four the uh, space whale? There is a space whale in four. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, Mark. My B is Bahamut, um, which I'm unclear on whether Bahamut as a creature exists outside of Final Fantasy, or is that just like what they call dragons in Final Fantasy? I that that's a good question. I don't I don't know the answer to it. For some reason, it sounds familiar outside of the context of Final Fantasy. I mean, there's Bahamut Lagoon, uh huh, but that's a Square Enix game. Okay, so. I don't know. It's, yeah, I don't know either. It, so, and and maybe uh, it has this specific name to like. So, this is a common summon in these games, um, and it all always, uh, despite the fact that it looks like it's breathing fire, it's always a like type neutral. Um, so, it's it's never actually attacking with fire damage, but just with like a massive blast of energy. Um, and I like the the Bahamuts a lot. Uh, it looks like Bahamut comes from uh, Islam, from Islamic. But uh, that's just from a tiny bit of Googling, so. Uh, and I did not do that tiny bit of Googling. <laughs> but that also makes sense in that, like, the other summons, they're also, like, Ifrit and Shiva, like, they're obviously borrowing those right. um, from, like, other uh, other faiths and mythologies and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, it stands to reason that um, Bahamut is as well. My B is Bubble Bobble. And the reason this is included is because I kind of forgot this, but Square Enix owns Taito. 
which it acquired in 2005. So Square Enix owns yeah. B- Bubble Bobble. It owns Space Invaders. It has kind of like that whole catalog yeah, of that's classic right. video games that I don't like really... arcade style games. Yeah, which I... means all the like bust a move games too. Yeah, which, uh, is basically what uh, kind of what Bubble Bobble is called in Japan. And they, the names aren't used totally interchangeably, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a weird scene. Yeah, I always forget that that is part of um, Square Enix's library. It doesn't feel like it really yeah. gets exploited in the same way that some of the other stuff does. Um, we should play Bubble Bubble. It's on the NES Classic Edition, right? Yes. I think we... It was, was it on the Classic Edition? I think it is. Because it's, it's not on the library. The, you and I did play, yeah. and the song just gets stuck in your head. Oh, it's one piece of music that does not stop throughout. We Mark, we shan't play it here. <laughs> um, moving on to C. My C is Crystal... Co- <clears throat> Crystal Chronicles, My Life as King, slash My Life as Dark Lord. This is a pair of Final Fantasy games exclusive to the Wii um, that were a bizarre, like, town simulator, slash king simulator, um, where you don't go out on adventures so much as you just have people in your in your village who do go out on adventures. This is a game that I owned uh, on, on Wii, could not wrap my head around, did not find it fun, but my roommate at the time, Andrew, was all about it. Actually, I say this, but I think he didn't enjoy playing it, <laughs> but he did play it. Um, I, I, I texted him about it uh, last week when I was coming up with this list to be like, hey, do you have any memories of this game? Because um, I, I know you played it for like 100 hours. Uh, and he was like, yeah, it was a, a cute little like town building thing. Uh, but I think I, I think I was bored most of the time while I was playing it. <laughs> the, uh, I, I never played it, but my the reason why it sticks in my head as being notable is because it was one of the first WiiWare yes. titles. Yes. Because it not only was it exclusive to Wii, but it, it never had any physical edition. It was just like something you could only buy through the eShop. Right. So Which, now can't get anywhere, probably. Right, right, right. And at the time, that was a novelty. Totally. That, like, it, that there would be anything. Like, it's up there with, like, World of Goo as, you know, one of those uh, that, like, you just you didn't even think it was possible. And then here it is. You can only buy it digitally. My C is for Chocobo, the majestic chickens of the, of the Final Fantasy world. Yeah. Um, mounts, in, you use them as mounts in lots of games, mm-hmm. ride them around. They're like a cross between a beautiful, beautiful chicken and an ostrich, uh, our dear chocobos. How do you feel about chocobos as we've moved into more realistic 3D graphics? They're getting a little, I miss the, um, the dumbness of yeah, the yes. original chocobos. When they just look like big, dumb idiots. Uh-huh. Big, stupid birds. They're a little too elegant, a little yeah. too uppity for me now. I feel like some of these chocobos are looking down at me. Yeah, you know? look, I don't need my chocobos to be horses, okay? <laughs> I need them to be pigs we ride. <laughs> yeah, yes. Who absolutely. are also birds. Uh-huh. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and I got to say, uh, the chocobo uh, breeding and racing in Final Fantasy VII, uh, mwah, one of my favorite parts of uh, an incredible game. Um, it, it, I sunk more time into that than probably any other single aspect of Final Fantasy VII. Um, yeah, just uh, truly a, a wonderful time. My D, although, hold on, because we need to pick, we still need to pick a bone with Chocobo uh, con- regarding this recent Chocobo Racing GP, a game oh, we, want, right. we wanted to play. We did really want to play, yeah. And uh, maybe, uh, well, maybe I was going to say, a chance to... maybe we should give it a chance? I don't, I don't know. Maybe after a few more updates and a price drop? Now you're talking. Uh, my D is Dragoon. This is a class of uh, of character in Final Fantasy. Uh, again, we are hewing really close to this Final Fantasy for all these. I promise they won't all be Final Fantasy. Um, but it is a, a class of like knights, basically, in Final Fantasy that have that uh, attack with spears um, and all have the ability to jump. Um, and I, I had considered having uh, JB for jump um, because it's such a strange attack where the character jumps off the screen and then they're just not present in the battle for a little while, presumably because they're up in the air jumping so high <laughs> and then they attack and deal a lot of damage. Um, and that's just what the dragoons do. Um, and uh, notably, uh, there's a, a, a dragoon main character in Final Fantasy uh, IX. Uh, Freya is a dragoon. Um, and then in Final Fantasy IV, Kane um, is like, starts off as a rival character. Or he starts off as your friend. 
double crosses you, is your rival for a long time, then joins your team, double crosses you again, and joins your team in the end. Um, the the journey of, of Kane and his relationship with Cecil is the best. I love it. Uh, so my D is Dragoon. My D is Dragon Quest Law. So this was something... Uh, Dragon Quest in Japan is so popular. R- incredibly popular and is released on Saturdays. Yes. In the first couple of releases of Dragon Quest, they were not on Saturdays. They were just on, you know, like Friday or a weekday or something. And dra- people would call out of school. They would call out of work to... I don't think you really have to call out of school. They would just not show up to school. They would call out of work. You could call out. <laughs> or like uh, have, your a, have parent a note. Does. Your parent, yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but... And so... It's important um, we nail it down. It's important that we nail it down, the specifics of it. Dra- so there was a w- kind of like internet rumor, I guess I would say, that there was a law in Japan that Dragon Quest c- had to be released on Saturdays so it didn't like hurt the Japanese economy from right. everybody calling out to play the game when a new one was released. But that is uh, an urban legend that is not actually true. But do the games come out on Saturday? Uh, the games do come out on Saturday, and they do come out on Saturday for the reason that they, you know, like, so people don't call out from work or they don't miss school for right, it. Right, but it's not a law. It wasn't mandated. So in the past couple of years, you know, as... The more, industry will regulate itself. <laughs> as more and more, as I guess Dragon Quest and the Dragon Quest creators have been doing more and more press outside of Japan. They've been asked about this. And basically, the it's still a little bit murky, but the genesis, genesis of it seems to be that the police in Tokyo did ask Enix <laughs> to not release it during the week. Amazing. But that there was no, like, mandate that they had to release it on Saturdays. Um, that's that's incredible. I, I, I almost can't believe that, <laughs> that, like, that they were approached by law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's very good. Uh, Mark, my on. E? E. My E is for... Evermore, because how could I possibly live with myself if it's not? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, Super Nintendo game Secret of Evermore, developed um, by a, a Square Studio in uh, the States, in Redmond, Washington. There you go. Um, uh, basically, for distribution only in North America, um, it is such a strange Secret of Mana like. Um, but the setting is unlike anything else that Square has ever like attempted since. It sort of like butts up against some of the same thematic ideas as Earth as Earthbound, but is far more fantastic uh, and like like fantasy oriented. Um, just an amazing little piece of uh, history that we're never gonna see again. A game that will never be re released. We've talked about Square er, about uh, Secret of Evermore on this podcast multiple times. I'm sure it'll come up again, but I had to give it a shout out here. My E is for Enix. So I realized you go, especially when I was making this list, that all I have a lot of strong memories and feelings about Square and games that were developed by Square or as Square Enix. You know, once they were combined, but I don't really know Enix that well outside of sure. Dragon Quest, and I didn't get into Dragon Quest until nine. So. Uh, until Dragon Quest Nine, not yeah, yeah, until sorry. you were nine years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, until in Dragon Quest Nine. So first of all, on this show, a couple of times I've been questioning, like, um, is it Enix? Is it Enix? And it turns out it is Enix because it's it comes. Woo! Sorry. Because <laughs> it comes from Phoenix, the word Phoenix. That's right. Um, and so here are some other games that Enix is known for or developed, and some of these I didn't even realize. So, Portopia, which was created by Yuji Horii, the creator of Dragon Quest. And it's a point-and-click adventure game for home computers and Famicom that is uh, notable in Japan for being, like, influential in kind of standardizing adventure games, but also being really influential influential and inspiring uh, Hideo Kojima and Eiji Aonuma. Mm. And they mark this as Portopia as a game that like really interests them to get into video games. Other games by Enix, Act Razor, uh, it it de- Street, which is kind of like a, a Monopoly, a Jan- Japanese version of Monopoly. Okay. Star Ocean didn't mm-hmm. realize that. Uh, Valkyrie Protophile, 
they acquired the Grandia later in its life. So these are all series that I've like heard of, but really Enix outside of Dragon Seventh Quest. Seventh Saga, you weren't going to say it, so I gotta. <laughs> yeah, outside outside of, you know, Dragon Quest, there aren't a lot of Enix ran- franchises that really like mean a lot to me as a gamer. Right. Well, and it's like, it, it is interesting how much uh, Dragon Quest has like spawned other games connected to it. It is their Final Fantasy, right? So like for every weird Final Fantasy spinoff, there's like six weird Dragon Quest spinoffs, yeah. right? So yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense that at some point they just like narrow in on the thing that, that works and the thing that makes money. Also, I don't know if we'll ever talk about it again, so or this episode. So I'm my other E, in case you also said Enix, was for Edge, which is the city that the bouncer takes place in. Very good. I'm glad we got one. Uh, we got one bouncer reference in here. Mark for my F. I'm talking about Frog from Chrono Trigger. <laughs> uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is no other answer for this. Sure, could be Final Fantasy, I guess. But Frog is the dopest dude in Chrono Trigger. Frog is great. He's a anthropomorphic frog who carries a big magical sword. Um, he w- He's a gentleman. <laughs> he speaks in like an old English accent uh, and has a tragic backstory about being a knight with his brother and blah, 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 blah. Um, he's... Wonderful. And the character design is impeccable. The All of uh, Chrono Trigger has amazing character designs. All seven of the playable characters are perfect as far as I'm concerned. Um, but Frog, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, his design is an 11. It's like, so good. It, he's got these, like, weird little tendrils that come off of his face, like like a mustache. It reads like a so well mustache. for being, like, a... Um this pixel art yes, on the totally. Super Nintendo. Yeah. Well, and just like th- he's animated very well too and that like everyone else walks but he hops cuz he's a frog and he's got a little cape that trails behind him. Uh it's just perfect. Frog is the best. My F is for Farm Out. So for most of its existence, Enix has been a publisher, but they didn't develop any games. Like Dragon Quest games were not de- they were never developed by Enix. They were it wasn't until Final Fantasy 10 that they were actually developed internally. What? Everything up to that, like wait, fin- wait, wait, wait. It wasn't until oh, sorry, sorry, Dragon Quest Ten. Okay, okay. That Dragon Quest games were developed. I was gonna say it was just like an arbitrary trigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. That dra- that Dragon Quest games were developed internally, which is kind of which is crazy. Huh. Like level five did dra- uh, Dragon Quest Nine, Eight, uh, and I am not sure who developed Seven. It may have been level five, but yeah, like I just thought that was again. I think of Square Enix as, at this point, one big, you know, like, enormous development company that does so much of its work in-house and all that kind of stuff. But Enix was really a publisher for most of its life. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there there is, uh, when you look at Dragon Quest and, like, what it is, it is a confluence of a bunch of unique talents in, like, the Japanese media market. So the role of a publisher there is still huge, right? Um, and assembling those talents to make those games. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, just an interesting point of history. Uh, my G is Garland, the villain from Final Fantasy I. Um, you fight him like first thing in the game, like within the first hour, you're like sent into a dungeon, you got to fight him. Um, and then he's the last boss too. Um, he just, his shadow looms large over the uh, beginning and end of that game. Uh, and, you know, that's the first one. So Garland. My G is for Gunblade, specifically the Gunblade nice. from fi- the Gunblades from Final Fantasy VIII. Are there other Gunblades? There are gu- other Gunblades in later games. Okay, but the thing I like about the Gunblade from Final Fantasy VIII is at this point it doesn't shoot projectiles, and and later iterations would shoot projectiles. What the gun how the Gunblade works in Final Fantasy VIII is the the gun part of it is like the hilt. And if you press, you know, like L1 or whatever yeah. at exactly the right time before you attack, it you get like a critical hit. You deal but a little like, more damage. In, in, in implying game, that you shoot it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in game, it's like, yeah, you are firing the gun at the end of the gun blade, which just kind of like, like I don't know, vibrates the blade or something. Whatever it does, it gives it a little more impact yeah, yeah, in yeah. your hit. And for whatever reason, that idea just feels very like steampunk, like pretty cool instead of like yeah like it's a gun that has a sword on it or it's a later, sword that later, has a gun on later it. iterations yeah. you know it's just like a sword that also is a gun and that's just not as cool to me right well it, it, it is funny that like the difference between like a gun with a bayonet like a gun that has a sword on the end of it you're like okay whatever it's that's that that's 
but that's what it is. But a thing that is mostly sword that like also has a gun <laughs> is very funny. Yeah. Um, that's a great one. Mark, my H is HD 2D, uh, which is Square Enix's whole approach to how they're going to bring their old games into the modern era and package them as modern games. Uh, it is also just like how they've decided their sort of like uh, um, budget titles or their sort of uh, not top of the line, technologically speaking, titles are going to be presented. Um, we've seen this in Octopath Traveler, in uh, Triangle Strategy, um, and it's just this very cool, very cool, very evocative presentation with these uh, like high def lighting and particle uh, effects all on top of like 16 bit slash 18 or uh, 16 slash 32 bit uh, pixels. Yeah, they've really HD 2D came at such a perfect time. And I feel like they are beginning, you know, with the remake of Dragon Quest 3 that's going to be coming this year, sometime soon. Sometime, yeah. They have really hit upon something that I think is such a great idea because it allows them to remake these older games, but without having to do like a Final Fantasy VII type, you know, remake. Right. Well, and also just like makes them a little bit more accessible, right? Like, yeah, because you can't, you can't do a Final Fantasy VII remake on Switch, right? You can do an HD 2D remake of something on Switch like that. That'll run. My H is also for HD, but not HD 2D, oh. just HD development. Because that's it's such an for me it's a very interesting time in Square Enix history, going from the PlayStation Two era to the PlayStation Three. PlayStation Two Square Enix was firing on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we would see this later with, with first of all, difficulties with HD development hit pretty much every publisher. Yeah, it ha hit Nintendo later because because they, they well, yeah they refused to do it. Until yeah, later. so they they didn't run into these difficulties until the Wii U era, but HD development was very challenging. It was a, a really challenging time for a lot of Japanese studios because development became way more expensive, mm -hmm. required way bigger workforce. You know, during this during this transition, during like the PS3 era, I remember, you know, interviews with people at Square Enix being like, towns are not pop, you know, like towns that you're, that you used to see in old Final Fantasy games and old Dragon Quest games, they're not possible in HD. It take it would take too much time. It would make right. you know take too many resources. It's just not doable. That's why Final Fantasy Thirteen uh, was criticized for being very linear. And you know whether that's fair or not, that was definitely like the narrative around it because it was a very different type of game. And Square Enix really struggled in the beginning of the PS3 era, trying just like because they had to relearn everything like how yeah. to develop games was very challenging in the HD era. Well, and uh, in in the on the PS3, the only Final Fantasy game they put out was I mean, there were 313 games, but just Final Fantasy 13, right? Um 14 was the MMO and then 15 wouldn't come out until like halfway through the PS4's life cycle. If you had a good tool set like Capcom apparently did like Capcom was firing on all cylinders the That's beginning true. of the They landed that early with yeah. uh uh with that that icy planet game Lon Lonely Planet Lonely Lone Planet? Something. Yeah, what was that called? It's not Lonely Planet. That's the that's the like guidebook series. But and Dead Rising is the other one. Yeah. What is the name of that game? Cold Planet? <laughs> um uh I'm actually gonna look it yeah, up. Yeah, look it up. It's bothering it up. me. Uh Lost Planet. Lost Planet. There we go. Yeah. And even, you know, like uh uh Resident Evil 5, like all of these. Yeah. So Capcom was yeah. kind of the exception. Capcom they had it going on. Yeah. They they figured it out. Yep. Um that's a good H. Uh my I is for I am Setsuna, um, which is one of the two games that the Tokyo RPG Factory, which is a sort of like subset of, of Square Enix, um, that they put out along with uh Lost Sphere. Um, and these are two RPGs sort of intentionally made in the throwback, um, like turn-based, uh, you know, old school Final Fantasy style. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to see this kind of RPG again um, because they're all of all of those efforts are being moved into the modern HD 2D games. Um, if they were going to make another another Lost Sphere now, they would just do it in HD 2D. Yeah, it definitely. I never played Ian Setsuna or Lost Sphere. Neither of them have like amazing reputations. Yeah, n neither of them do. And I, I, I've played the first couple hours of both of these games, um, and I mean that that's not really a, a measure of whether they're good RPGs or not. I've given up four hours into some of the best RPGs <laughs> of all time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's they they don't have. Um, 
Well, I am Setsuna has a really cool uh, like hook at the beginning of it um, that is like a, a it's a uh, you're either playing as or you're accompanying like a a sacrificial someone who's like going to be sacrificed to the gods um, and then like stuff goes haywire um, and it's just like a neat little like she was destined for this thing but uh, something else happened. Um, but yeah, just sort of after playing it for a little while, being like, okay, I, I get what this is and the uh, whatever the hook of the combat is, I'm not really getting it. It definitely feels like you were saying the Octopath Traveler, the HD2D stuff kind of like stole its thunder, yeah, like totally. nailed what those R- Tokyo RPG Factory games were trying to do, which was recapture kind of like the spirit of those right. 16-bit RPGs. But, but presenting them in a way that could still capitalize on 16-bit nostalgia uh-huh. without there being like a s- source material to draw upon. Yeah. My eye is illegal street racing. Okay. So the street racing epidemic, there's apparently a street racing epidemic in Japan in the 80s, uh-huh. and it was the inspiration for a Tokyo square Drift. game called Racing Lagoon. A 1999 Square game that combines car racing Mm -hmm. and RPG elements that I first heard about on an episode of Retronauts. It never released outside of Japan, but an English fan translation was released in November 2021. The uh, I was actually listening to the soundtrack to it today. It's amazing. This like really great electronic jazz. The it. Apparently, the street racing, like the car racing segments, not that great, but it is funny that the it's interesting to see the mashup between uh, car racing and RPG. So there is an overworld map and you're driving around the city and it's all, you know, like at night and it actually kind of the aesthetic of the game is pretty cool. And then there are still random encounters with other cars that want to race you. And so what they do is like a car will like drive up behind you and it like flashes its headlights. And then that's how you enter the random encounter. And the random encounter is like a, you know, 3d street race. It's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I am fascinated by this era of square where they were like flush with, uh, with Final Fantasy VII cash. Yeah. And development wasn't super expensive. You could still make PlayStation 2 games with a fairly small team. And so you got all of these kind of like crazy side projects like... The Bouncer. Like The Bouncer, like Racing Lagoon from... uh, Like The Bouncer was created by one of the directors of Chrono Trigger, the director of uh, Parasite Eve. We were talking about this just a couple of weeks ago. It's just kind of like nuts. Yeah, it was was the Wild West at that point. Um, all right, that's very good. My J is, uh, and you'll need to help me with this a little bit because it's been a little bit since I played Dragon Quest XI S episode of an elusive age definitive edition for the Nintendo Switch. My J is Jade, the cousin of the Luminary sister. Sister in what is her relationship think, to the hero? I think cousin. I don't think they're. I think cousin yeah, is right. I think cousin. Um, just introduced in such a cool way as a sort of like stoic murder babe um who then like reveals herself to be uh like a protector of the luminary and just a a cool dynamic fun character with a a great evocative character design uh i think jade's really good yeah i i am so i'm you know playing dragon quest 11 as psychos and elusive age definitive edition for the nintendo switch right now and i'm beginning in i'm in act two and i'm beginning to like gather people and it's challenging for me at this point to determine who to put into my party because yeah. I like so many of the characters. Yes. So, which is which is the great curse of that game <laughs> is that yeah. the at the end you're like, oh no, I love them all. Yeah. Yes. My J is job system. Yeah. Great. First introduced to, in Final Fantasy three. Uh, you know, a job system basically allows characters to change classes, which was um, new at the time. I've never played Final Fantasy 3. There's the, for the longest time, like the original Final Fantasy 3 was never released outside of Japan. There was a Nintendo DS remake, which was the first time a version of the game was officially playable. And, uh, but I don't think in America, like a, the original game is playable at all unless you get like i mean it is it is now it is now in the uh the the pixel remasters oh yeah Yeah. but even that is like a remaster like i don't think you can get the super famicom or famicom i think it's just famicom yeah yeah. like uh rom yeah that yeah that is weird and it's cool to see that like 
the job system and even like calling it a job system uh, is sort of uh, pervasive throughout Square Enix's franchises in general. Because like that's part of the Bravely series, right? The, like Bravely Default 2, they have the characters have jobs. Um, uh, they have them in Octopath. They have them in Final Fantasy V. They, you know, it's uh, sort of all over the place. So yeah, that that is a cool like persistent thing that they landed on. And we're like, this works. Jobs. My K. Mark, if I ask you who the best villain of all time is in a video game, what are you going to say? The answer is Kefka from Final <laughs> Fantasy VI. He's an evil clown, kind of, who's the right-hand man to the emperor who couldn't give a crap about the the empire's goals. He is there as a pure chaos agent. He likes working for the empire because they do bad things. He's the one who sabotages what's happening at the midpoint of the game and causes the world to end. Kefka kills and replaces God. So when you are marching to the final battle to fight Kefka, you are ascending into heaven to kill this golden version of a clown man who's been terrorizing you through two different versions of the world. Uh, Kefka's just uh, he he's he's the ultimate. I don't think he's been topped even by characters as like villains as cool as like Sephiroth or I don't know, name another one. Like Kefka's just number one. That's that's a really good one. Uh, my K is our obligatory and probably only mention of Kingdom Hearts on this list. Oh, very good. Um, Sora, Keyblade, you know the whole deal. But p- part of what <laughs> that's the whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> part of what I think is interesting to me about Kingdom Hearts yes. and, uh, is that it's kind of part of what saved SquareSoft after the Final Fantasy Spirits Within movie bombed. Like they lost a ton of mo- money on Spirits Within, and uh, well, I will in on my list be talking about all of this a little bit later, but. Kingdom Hearts played a really big part in saving Square Enix and saving the Square Enix merger. And a lot of that being just from like a smart um, like marketing deal with Disney, right? Like I, I'm i still, and we'll probably never know what it was that made Disney go, uh, yeah, you can use our, literally our most iconic characters. Yeah, or how that conversation got started. Yeah. Like who approached who? I, I don't know. And why? Because, like, you know, Disney prides itself. And this this wasn't, like, during a, a weird time or a bad time for Disney either, right? Like, this isn't, like, a, a mid-'80s Disney or something. This is, like, late-'90s, early-2000s oh, Disney. Oh, that actually was not actually, a great I guess time. That's, that's true. That's, yeah, for Disney. Because that's when, you know, they, like, bought Go.com and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so. Okay, so maybe that is part of it, too, yeah. that Disney was in a little bit of a weird place. They're both in a weird place <laughs> looking to each other for help. Um, but it's just, like... Disney knowing its own icon status being like, uh, yeah, we'll team up with Square Enix kind of icon, like definitely icons in some circles, but like it's not teaming up with Nintendo, you no. know? And like you said, our most valuable characters. Yes. Yes. And then all in, in addition to that, like then they visit kingdoms that are based on other classic animated movies and like more modern ones too. Like the uh, Hercules for sure is, uh, you know, a, a mainstay of, of that. And it's just like, why, why, why did they give them the keys to the kingdom? Like, yeah, that? It's, it's so weird. Uh, next one, I don't have too much to say about because it's just something I'm excited about. L for Live Alive. Um, I'm very excited to play. This is a, a game that was on the Super Famicom, did not make it to the States, um, but has sort of a legendary reputation as being um, this sort of twisty, uh, spanning time periods RPG. Um, it's coming out in an HD 2D version uh, later this year, and I'm very excited to play it. My L is for Lindblom from Final Fantasy IX. Yes. It is one of my favorite towns in any RPG ever. I think the art in Final Fantasy IX, I just really love the world of Final Fantasy IX. Yeah. The way that it's like towering on a bluff and it it's positioned at the edge of the Mist Continent, which I just think is such a wonderful, like evocative name for a continent. You t- take air cabs to travel to like the four oh. different districts yeah. within it. I just think it's, I, I think it's a great, great location. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And the, the fact that the game like, sort of revolves around it in a way that uh, uh, like other Final Fantasy games don't really like Midgar comes close in Final Fantasy 7 uh, as just like a, a a focal point that you keep coming back to even though there's the, a whole wide world out there um 
yeah, Lindblom is uh, that. That's a great pull. Um, my M, your mentioning of of Mist earlier uh, made me realize that like Mist is a, a recurring Final Fantasy thing as well. Um, but that's not my M. Uh, my M is Moogle. Um, the weird little white pig fairy things uh, in in the Final Fantasy series. Um, I don't totally understand what they are, but they're the cutest. It, it's it's like your C, like Chocobo, um, that's just like a kind of creature that they made up and is now uh, just absolutely instrumental to the series. And Moogles, unlike Chocobos, I don't feel like they've really tried to make them like hyper realistic. There, th- there are some Moogles that uh, you don't want to see. <laughs> But like you know, in uh, in Final Fantasy VII remake, for example, um, there are they make mention of Moogles and people dress up as Moogles. Uh-huh. But it's like the graphics are too good, the fidelity is too oh, high. Sure. They're like we can't, we cannot <laughs> render an we, actual we Moogle like this. Show. It's yeah. too hor- it's too <laughs> horrific. My M is for the merger between Square and nice, Enix. Nice. So this happened in two thousand three. Some things that I didn't realize about the merger was that they had been talking about it for a long time. It was something that they looked at as early as 2000. But when Square, when the value of Square uh, dropped, when Square was having Square was having a lot of money problems after the Final Fantasy Spirits Within bombed, uh, that's kind of like what put the merger on hold. And it wasn't until Square got its feet back with games like Kingdom Hearts that it became like attractive again, which I thought was really interesting because you would think that maybe enix would when square square was worth less that that would be a good time to acquire it but i guess that but when something isn't worth that much money why do would you want to acquire it yeah i guess so i guess so but yeah i I thought that was you know what we understand really well is business (laughs) (laughs) it's also crazy that it's been 19 years since these companies were merged like as far as i've been conscious they've been a company together like for you know, for as long as I can remember, basically. Sure. Well, it, and I guess it is good to point out at this point that we've definitely referred to things in our ABCs of Square Enix that have just been Square or that have just been Enix for sure. Yeah. Before they merged. Yeah. Um. But uh, you know, it, that's a weird caveat to throw halfway through the list. My <laughs> N is for Neku Sakuraba, uh, who is the hero from The World Ends with You. Um, the World Ends with You, a DS game where you play as a d- dude in like a sort of spiritual tournament. That thing that happens uh, in Tokyo. The, the, uh, I don't understand the story. I've played the game. I don't understand the story. But the thing that is so attractive about um, the World Ends with You is that it is stylish as all get out. The music is rad. The clothes are rad, and nothing in this game embodies it more than Neku himself. Um, he's wearing like a blue jumpsuit and these giant blue headphones, and he's got like anime as heck hair. Um, it, it, she, he he is the world ends with you. That's a good. That's a really good one. Thank you. I my N is for Nintendo sixty four. Oh, what could have been? Oh, what just is not? It is not. Yeah, you know, uh, Square specifically had, I guess Enix as well had such a strong relationship with Nintendo in the NES and Super NES era, and with the Nintendo, you know, games like. Um, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy were associated with Nintendo platforms. Yeah. And all of that changed in the Nintendo 64. Out the window. PlayStation era. Right. You know, part of this famously is that Nintendo went with cartridges, which were incredibly expensive versus... And limiting. And so limiting. Not, not only were, was it, would it be expensive to get the highest memory uh, cartridges to put Final Fantasy VII on one of these things, they didn't make a cartridge big enough for Final Fantasy VII. It simply didn't exist. Yeah, CD-ROMs were a lot cheaper. Yep. You could, you know, have games be four discs for a lot less than a single yep. Nintendo 64 cartridge. Also, I think, you know, like, Nintendo was famously heavy-handed. They were very controlling of third-party developers, and I think, you know, Square and Enix and other developers at the time were eager to move to a platform where they had a little bit more control. Yeah, and I think yeah, they actually had a lot more control uh, on, on something like PlayStation. Um, Mark, I don't... F- I don't really have an O. Do you have an O that you want to go with? My O is the opera sequence from Final Fantasy VI. Mark, you take the cake. <laughs> I, I wrote in here Octopath, but I was like, I don't really want it. We, I've, we've talked about That's it. That's a good one, too, though. Yeah, but let's talk about the opera scene in Final Fantasy VI. So 
I think the reason why you, even if you've played, if you have not played Final Fantasy VI, you may have heard of people talking about the opera scene. And the Final Fantasy VI was a is a Super Nintendo game or yes. a Super Famicom game. And one of the things that it is so, uh, why the opera sequence is so interesting and why it does loom large in a lot of people's memory is because it was unlike anything that had ever really been seen in a game before in that like you know this was before an era of like cutscenes really or anything like that yeah. and here was this almost like cinematic moment that there is like gameplay involved mm -hmm. but it is very much just like focusing for a few there's two kind of like parts to it there's the opera the whole opera sequence itself which has you know like characters getting up during the opera and going to do stuff and there's this really funny business with like ultras trying who is know, an octopus who you wronged earlier <laughs> and he like falls onto the stage right and so your characters have to kind of like make it up as they go along to keep the opera going like and it, it turns into this boss battle against on Ultras, stage yeah with yeah. the orchestra providing like the accompaniment mm -hmm. so all of that is really all of that business is is fun but also there's just like a moment in it when uh celeste she it looks like the reason you're doing this whole thing is because she looks like the star of the opera and who anyways basically she looks like the star of the opera so they, right. you switch places she looks like the star of the opera who is uh being lusted after by setzer who i referred to uh, earlier in the episode and he has left a note saying that during the final act of the opera he's going to kidnap her and you and you want to be kidnapped because you, you want steal to steal you want to get yes. onto the airship which is the blackjack so you can steal it yes but so Amidst all this chaos, there's just this moment where you are Celeste. Yes. And, and you're, you're on in... this, like, tower. Well, so, I mean, e e even before that, you're in the dressing room. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, and you can, like, review the script. Um, and it's important that you do this because when you do get out on stage and you're on this tower, um, the song is playing and uh, she's singing along. And then every now and then it'll prompt you to be like, what's the next line? And if you didn't learn your lines, then you may screw up the opera and have to like do the whole thing again. Um, and it's the, I, it, that's just like a fun little like gameplay thing. It's fun to think that you like have this control over this moment of, are you pulling off the heist well or not? Um, but beyond that, uh, Celeste's journey throughout that game is so based in, she was a tool for, she's a, she's a, a, a general for the empire. She's basically a living weapon, right? Um, and it's uh, Locke, one of your characters, who like sees her as a human being for the first time and who encourages her through this opera sequence to be like, you can do this, you can sing this part, you can like, yeah, just emote, like just be human. And it's the sort of thing that like she doesn't know that she can do or be or portray. And then that she does it throughout the course of this opera sequence. It's just like the perfect synergy of uh, awesome set piece, fun gameplay stuff and genuine character growth that like is the best case scenario for any video game or artist expression of any kind. It's, it is, it's very, very cool. And there's uh, just this moment where you, you know, Celeste is, or it's Celeste. I'm actually not sure how you Doesn't say it, matter. but like is, <laughs> you know, on this, this set piece on stage, it's like this uh, tower in the night. And the opera itself, like, begins to play. And, yes, it is on a Super Nintendo. And, you know, so they're making some of, like, the singing noises with a sample. And right. it's, you know, kind of sounds like a, a pig is being sat on. But it... But, like, uh, filtered through a vocorder. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. A beautiful pig. Yes. A beautiful voice. But <laughs> it, um, it's just, like, this moment of art where the yes. game just, like, slows down... You know, the music in Final Fantasy VI is beautiful. It's just something that you just rarely experience in a game of this era. Can I keep going on this for yeah, a second? Yeah, please. Um, because the the themes from the opera end up becoming her uh, late motif uh, throughout the rest of the, the game. So, like, when she has big character moments later on, you will hear that same music again. Um, notably, when she wakes up alone in the world of ruin after Kefka has destroyed everything. Um, and she finds herself alone on an Island with this dude, Sid, um, who is like nursed her back to health and is like, I think we're the only people left in the world. Um, and he either dies or 
th- there's a version of this where he he dies because you fed him bad fish, um, and Celeste goes up to the top of like this this cliffside, um, and the game sort of like slows down again, echo echoing exactly this moment from the opera, playing the same music, and she gives up. She hurls herself off the cliff. She attempts suicide, um, and like wakes up on the beach and is like, oh, I I can't like this world has taken everything from me. I'm just going to set sail on the ocean and see what I find. Um, and it's just, I don't, I, the, the, the fact that they're, they're able to call back this opera stuff, both in terms of the music and the uh, like visuals in a moment of like true desperation for it is just so awesome. Yeah. I just, Final Fantasy VI. It's so good. It's such a good it's game. It's very good. My P is Popoy, which is the little sprite character from um, Secret of Mana. The characters have names. Uh, have names. They don't. They're not like default names. In in the, uh, a, the you can you can name all the characters, all three of the characters, but they canonically have names. The sprite's name is Popoy. P O P O I. I don't think uh, I knew that. Yeah, it's weird, right? Um, and it's just I always like that there is a. Uh, there's the um, there's the man, or the, I guess they're they're all young, right? So there, there's the boy who's the hero. There's uh, the girl who's like the princess, also a hero. And then this, I, I think they I think they refer to the sprite as he, but I choose to believe that the sprite is a non binary non binary icon um, who casts chaos magic uh, and learns uh, you know dark powers. And it's just this weird little uh, scamp and scammer, uh, and is really rude to everyone. Uh, I think Papoy is uh, is. A, a great dynamic character in a game that is, you know, full of a lot of, like, sort of fantasy tropes. My P is for PlayStation and PlayStation 2. I talked about this a little bit mm-hmm. when I talked about Racing Lagoon. But basically, even though I did not own a PlayStation or PlayStation 2 when they first came out, I went back and replayed those a lot of those games on my friend's PlayStation 2 during the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 era. And... Uh, as much as I love a lot of the Super Nintendo, you know, Square, and I guess really mostly like Square stuff like Chrono Trigger and everything like that, it's really the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 stuff that looms large in my mind. Yeah. You know, I have kind of fallen out of Final Fantasy, the Final Fantasies. I haven't played 15. I played 13, but didn't play any of the sequels. You know, I've never touched the MMO or anything like that. So this is really kind of like the, uh, to this point in my life, like last hurrah of Final Fantasies to me. And I think that, you know, 10 is great. Uh, 12 is great. I love se- I have 7 and 9. Um, 9 especially is, you know, a Final Fantasy that is very close to my heart. And so I really... Tactics is in there too. Tactics is in there. These... Uh, no, 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 like severe shade to 8, right? Like... No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, it, it was such a... It's just the only one you didn't mention. Eight, eight, <laughs> yeah. 8 is such a... I haven't played 8 yeah. for, you know, like I... Uh, 8 is not my favorite. It was... But 8 was such a fun one to talk about with friends because it is so different from the others. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, yeah, it's just a, it's an era, plus, you know, all this stuff that I love talking about, even though I never played it, like the Bouncer and all these weird square side projects. It's just an era that looms really large in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, my cue is for Quest, specifically Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Mark, did you ever play Final Fantasy Mystic Quest? No. This is the Super NES release um, that was designed for Western audiences, which means it's easy and all of the it's very linear there's no exploration um it is a dull story and a bad game much <laughs> uh, it's 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 like they made final fantasy 4 but bad um yeah it's just a a, a really crummy game that is, says final fantasy on it and looks and sounds like a final fantasy game is it was it developed you know in japan yeah i think so yeah and is it like final fantasy legends where they took a different game no. and made it or it was just created like Hey, we need to make a game for the dum dums and yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. that was one hundred percent what it was. <laughs> uh, my cue is for Queen Nimbus, uh, Mallow's mom in Super Mario RPG. Uh, that's great. Love Mallow's mom in Super Mario RPG. Um, I love the the Nimbus Kingdom. The the character designs of both King and Queen Nimbus very funny. I um I just like a lot in their dumb little outfits. I mean, the all of the, all of the the Nimbuses. Uh, Mallow himself is a hilarious character. He is 
a cloud. He thinks he's a frog <laughs> or a tadpole. <laughs> I don't know. He's uh, and when he cries, it rains. Like uh, he's uh, he's too good of a character. Just too good. My R is for Radical Dreamers, the pseudo sequel, pseudo prequel to uh, uh, sequel to Chrono Trigger, prequel to uh, Chrono Cross. Um, a strange text based adventure um, that uses some of the same characters from trigger set in the world no sorry characters from cross in the world of trigger um yeah we we've talked about it on on the show before it is a strange little experience and i'm so glad that it is part of the chrono cross radical dreamers edition my r is for remake specifically the final fantasy 7 remake that was originally basically what happened was that in e3 2005, yes. where the PlayStation 3 was revealed at, I think it was at Sony's conference, they showed the opening moments of Final Fantasy VII remade using, you know, like HD technology. Was this not at a PlayStation experience? I don't think so. I'm pretty conference? sure it premiered okay. at E3. Okay, okay. So um, from that moment on, whether, I don't think it was intentional, but that's Square would be asked about a Final Fantasy remake. A, re- a Final Fantasy VII remake would be talked about endlessly until right. it was finally revealed for true over like 15 years later and or like more than 10 years later and finally released right. like... In 2019. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, it was just one of those things that like once it happened, they couldn't close the barn door after it. Like it was gone right and final fantasy 7 remake was something that was just out there that they basically like had to fulfill whether they intended to or not when they showed that little clip uh and i you have to respect what they actually did with final fantasy 7 remake um and i don't know if this is like the appropriate venue for us to talk about what that game actually is or like spoilers about it or anything um but just know that it, it takes the uh the premise of remaking the game um like seriously right that uh there are in world reasons and like in narrative reasons for revisiting the story of final fantasy 7 um and it is a remarkable trippy awesome thing wrapped up in the nostalgia of final fantasy 7 and a really engaging um uh, like combat loop uh it's a shame it'll never come to switch or anything uh and any uh, really anything that's not uh playstation right like it's it has it's not on xbox yet i don't think it's on xbox i might be on i can't PC, remember though. if it's on pc or might not be, but be. yeah yeah sony and square enix definitely have a cozy relationship at the moment right 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 um final fantasy 16 is going to be coming out on uh playstation exclusively uh my s is for slime uh, one of the, look, I know everyone talks about it, but the monster design in Dragon Quest, perfect. They are these just distilled cartoony little figures that are more charismatic than the heroes always. <laughs> um, and the slime is sort of a perfect representation of that. It is just a little blob with a smiley face on yeah, it. Yeah, it kind of looks like a Hershey kiss. It looks like a little blue Hershey kiss. There are also red ones and metal ones and whatever. Um, but the blue one is sort of the, the the quintessential one. I think of that slime controller, um, which is it's like the bottom of a slime has like a, a PlayStation controller on it. Um, very cool, immediately evocative of uh the the game series and i think i think in terms of like simplicity of character design to uh like very being very obviously identifiable with a brand um or with a with a game brand i think it's slime and pac-man and that's it like those are the two i can't think of a simpler design than those two and they both immediately communicate the game yeah man the slime endures for sure slime it's like endures. it's the it's the mascot of the Dragon Quest series. Totally. My S, is, I've talked about it uh, leading up to this, but is Spirits Within, Final Woo! Fantasy Spirits Within, the full-length feature animated film developed or created by Square that was to kind of kick off a, intended to kick off a whole new endeavor for them, making these hyper 
realistic animated films. So this it was released in 2001 and imagine like it was it was ahead of its time in what they were intending to do. Again, the aim was for photorealism. Kind of what they talked about is there's a, a character in Spirits Within, the main character, her name is Aki, A-K-I. And the idea was that, you know, they were positioning Aki was a character in the film, but would also be an, an actress actor, an in actress other movies. Yeah. That would, like, she would sh- show up in other, you know, Square Enix films in the future. So much money was poured into it. Um, they set up like a rendering farm and I think maybe a lot of the uh, film was created in Hawaii. So they definitely set up like a, they spent, you know, like five years creating this rendering farm because it took so much computer power, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001 to render each frame of this movie came out, was uh, critically kind of like, not even like lambasted, almost just like ignored. Didn't get great reviews. Well, because it has a, a typically Final Fantasy convoluted story where very like, convoluted. It's the spirit of the planet that's you know rising to whatever. Um, but the cast of this movie is stacked: Ming Na Wen, Alec Baldwin, Perry Gilpin, James Wood, Steve Buscemi, Donald Sutherland, Ving Rhames. Like what? is happening here. <laughs> yeah. They I mean, spent so much money they spent on this. So thing. much money. And when it it basically bombed yeah. and lost Square a ton of money. They never attempted to make a movie again, obviously. Put the company in uh, you know, kind of financial dire straits for a while. M- postponed the Enix and Square merger that would take a few years. But um, did, have you ever seen Spirits Within? Did I you saw it in the it? theater, I yeah. I saw it in theaters, too. I think too. I saw it twice. I, I remember nothing about it, but I do remember being bored. Yeah, yeah, I remember being bored as well. Um, uh, the other thing that I remember is that uh, a couple years later when the Animatrix came out, that there was a one of these shorts in the Animatrix was done by the same studio that had done uh, Spirits Within. And then, to my knowledge, that's all they ever did. Yeah, I think that's right. I believe I it was called right. Final Flight of the Osiris is the name of the short. Also, if you want a sna- just a snapshot in time, let me tell you that Aki um, was featured in Maxim's Top 100. Maybe things are better now. <laughs> uh, my T is Toriyama, Akira Toriyama, the character designer, famously for Dragon Ball, but also for Dragon Quest um, and uh, Chrono Trigger, and it has just a bunch of the the Akira Toriyama look of Dragon Quest. Uh, it is remarkable how consistent it is. Right, that like once they landed on like that's what these characters look like. That was it forever. Like you, you look at Dragon Quest One. You look at Dragon Quest Eleven. As I because of an elusive age definitive edition for the Nintendo Switch, they always look like that. They never change the design of these things. It is really interesting, especially when like you know the other heavy hitter hitting franchises change over time. Zelda yes. looks different from game to game. Right. The Final Fantasy, you know, looks different from game to game. But Dragon Quest, like that slime, endures. Like that yes. is Dragon Quest. Well, and like you, if you see a Dragon Quest character. You may at one point say, "Is that a Dragon Ball character?" <laughs> um, but otherwise, you you know exactly you 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 can see you can see Akira Toriyama's work, right? Yeah. Like it just it's uh it, it's it's like a it's like when uh, Disenchantment came out. Is that the name of the series? The the Matt Groening. Um, the oh, one on Netflix, could be, yeah. Disenchanted, Disenchantment, something like that. Uh, it's like when that comes out and you immediately see it and you're like, that's a graining design, or at least like based on degra- graining's design aesthetic, um, which is probably also what's happening with uh, Akira Toriyama now. Right. right. Like he can't possibly be designing all the Dragon Quest stuff. Right. But they, it's, they, they've built the industry around designing like him. Absolutely. But you're totally right. Dragon Quest characters and Dragon Ball characters definitely go to the same barber. Yes. One They're getting their hair cut at the same place. Yes. My T is for towns. Talked a li- oh. little bit about this with uh, Lindblom. You mentioned Midgard. That's another great example. I feel like for me, when I think of, you know, these like Square and Enix RPGs, the comfort of a good town in an RPG, a good town theme, it uh, just it can be such like a strong part of what makes an RPG enjoyable are these spaces that are fun to hang out in. 
Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. The, the, the towns are what make them not just dungeon crawlers. That's 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 what makes it uh, a, a world that you're inhabiting. Yeah, exactly. Just a place where you can kind of rest for a little bit, check things out, talk to people. Kind of, you get a good like feel and sense of the world outside of the narrative of the game. Uh, all right, Mark, my you is for Uematsu, Nobo Uematsu, uh, the composer of Final Fantasy um, and uh, so many other things. He's been with the series since the beginning. I'm playing the uh, uh, orchestration of the, the prelude music right now. Um, the series wouldn't be what it is without uh, Nobu Uematsu. Um, so I just wanted to shout him out here. Uh, Patrick, Uematsu, this is our one, or so far anyways, so far. overlap. Uh, I also have Uematsu. I agree with everything you said also just wanted to use it as a gateway to talk about the amazing music in so many of these games yes um so, so many great soundtracks across both libraries it's uh just pretty amazing yeah i mean he, he's he's like an all-timer and uh, honestly like there are so few things that we know in video game composition um and it's it just speaks to the power of uh uematsu's uh, work that you know that we all, all know this one um mark i wonder if our v is gonna overlap oh okay my v is vv oh no it's not going okay to. great um so this is well because you were talking such a good game about final fantasy IX. yeah but i don't remember i don't like vv that much yeah mark's insane <laughs> um i love vv he is a living doll or yeah it, it's like a it's like a creature that's been manufactured um and mass he's just one of them um and uh he uh, like becomes unplugged from his programming and has to like choose his own sort of existence going forward he knows that there is a ticking clock on his life um that like after a certain amount of time he's just going to like shut down because that's what these creatures do um and uh the game gives you no resolution on like does he die at the end of the game like he expects to or does he continue and almost doesn't matter um, because he's already chosen his own path in life. He helps his friends and whatnot. Um, but the thing that I love about Vivi so much is that he makes literal the sort of promise of the rest of the game, which is uh, bringing back the uh, fundamental pillars of the original Final Fantasy. Um, the Zidane, the main character that you're playing as, he's obviously the thief. Uh, Princess Dagger, she is uh, obviously the white mage. Steiner is your fighter. Um, like all of the characters fall into these very like the very easy classes and like everything in the game you can trace back to Final Fantasy, uh, the original. Um, and Vivi, you don't have to do any work because he just looks like the black mage. Yep. The giant hat, the glowing eyes, the like cloak that comes up to his cheeks. Um, uh, he's great. I like Vivi a lot. I'm sorry that you don't, Mark. Um, but it, it's a, a he's a, he's a lasting image for me in that for game. For sure. For sure. My V is Vex and the Mesmers. What? Which is the working title for Secret of Evermore. What? Yeah, so this is from Wikipedia. Quote, oh, that sounds like it was uh, like one of the uh, movies that the kid is referencing where he's like, oh, this is just like what happened to Captain Crapo and <laughs> Vex and the Nesmers. So from uh, producer Alan Weiss's original concept had a group of magic users who, quote, could tell dream oh. stories and transport the listeners into, ex into the experience virtually. During a storytelling session, Vex is trapped and starts to corrupt the dreams. The game has to the game was to have the player find Vex and defeat him. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I had no idea. Is Secret of Evermore a better name or a worse name? We'll never know. <laughs> Vex and the Mesmers, uh a great band name, potentially. Yeah, totally. Um, my W is for Woolsey, Ted Woolsey who was a translator working for Square Enix in the Super NES era and is largely credited with translating all of the Super NES Square RPGs. Wow. Um, and uh, the place where this was evidently the most Herculean task was in translating uh, Secret of Mana, which was just wall-to-wall -wall text. And there's a real issue when uh, working with um, Super Nintendo games of uh, you're limited to the same physical space that the Japanese games used to uh, put all the text in, but 
Japanese text is so much more dense uh, in in its readability than English text. Like it just physically takes up more space to put a, a, an English word than uh, because, a Japanese word. Because like the word. kanji characters can convey much more meaning That's than a right. single letter. Um, uh, and so uh, there are just like huge like blocks of text that had to be reduced to like two sentences. Um, and so like any wonky little weird thing that doesn't make sense or anything that is beautifully distilled down into five or six words, uh, we can trace back to uh, Woolsey here. That's amazing. Uh, my W is for Vonzers, the mech suits from the Front Mission series. Okay. And uh, the I, I've never played any Front Mission series, but it is... Are you going to play them when they're re-released on Switch? Yeah, there's a, the remake of the first one is... And the announced. remake of the second one. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. announced not that long ago. I think the first one is supposed to come out this year. When I was looking up Front Mission and trying to learn a little bit more about it, there was also a uh, Super Famicom game that was never released in America. That's like a 2D side-scrolling game that's kind of, you know, like a Contra or um, like a, a, a Final... F or I. Just like a side scrolling like beat 'em up, but with mech sure. suits. It actually looks awesome. Like like Final Fight is that? Yeah, what you're yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, Vonzers is my W. Um, weird. Mark my X is for Xeno Gears. <gasps> my X is also for Xeno Gears. And I think Xeno look Xeno Gears never appeared on a PlayStation or on a uh, a Nintendo platform, and it probably never will. Um, but Xeno Gears. Uh, was developed at, so came out at Square Enix, but was developed by or created by the husband wife team of Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Taka, uh, uh, Tanaka. Um, that uh, would eventually their team up would eventually become Monolith Soft, um, which is the uh, studio that was eventually purchased by Nintendo and makes the Xenoblade Chronicles games. Yeah, that's right. Something that also is kind of interesting about Xenogears is that it was originally a pitch for Final Fantasy VII. Yep. And it was also briefly developed as a Chrono Trigger sequel before it was being spun off into its own thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's it's cool to see something like this. And, you know, it's what, like 95, 96, something like that. Um, so it's not actually that late in like the Square's development. But like you know, way later than uh, uh, Final Fantasy or, or Dragon Quest, sort of form its own identity um, and then, like, you know, shake free of the bonds of, of Square Enix to become something else somewhere else. Um, and it's cool that it landed, uh, or, you know, obviously not Xenogears, but that uh, Monolith landed at Nintendo. Yeah. And that the sort of spiritual um, sequel to it, the Xenoblade Chronicles series, is now a like mainstay of Nintendo. I've also I've never played Xenogears, but I, it's notable for its apparent like incredibly heavy religious and psychological themes. Like yep. Freudian and like Jungian theory play a really big part in it. Um, I don't know. It's just uh, one of those fascinating artifacts of the time. Yep. Um, my why is for Yadrasil, the world tree or the tree of life or whatever you, it's, uh, a, a frequent, it frequently appears in the Dragon Quest series, notably in Dragon Quest 11, S, Echoes of Elusive Age, Definitive Edition for the Nintendo Switch, where the climax of the first act takes place, um, and some tragic events, uh, near the climax of act two, um, that Mark is not privy to yet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it just, a you know, um, the, the whole concept of like, uh, being able to gauge the world's health by how the tree is doing um, and needing to restore the tree. I don't know. It's a, it's a cool like fantasy thing and it just feels very sticky and rad. My why is for Yuji Hori, the creator of Dragon Quest, the supervisor and scenario writer of Chrono Trigger, among other things. I um, We've talked a lot about both of these things, Dragon Quest and Chrono Trigger, but kind of remarkable that Yuji Hori is still at the helm of Dragon Quest all of these years later, they are still kind of like each game is his vision yeah. in one form or another. Also just notable how insane Chrono Trigger existing is yes. and what a like perfect moment in time. It was like the best of Japanese RPG development. You had, you know, Square and Enix were still two separate entities, but still Yuji Hori was working on a Square RPG and Akira Toriyama and Akira Toriyama like um yeah just kind of amazing that that thing exists yeah uh, I, I I mean 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, that 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 that's a great why. Do you remember during the uh, Dragon Quest event um, at some point over the pandemic, maybe two years ago, um, that like Yuji Hori came out for part of it and was like being interviewed by that comedian guy yeah. that was hosting it. Um, so like he's still front and center. Like it's uh, I, I I love having these like because we don't have one of those for Final Fantasy, right? No, like, not anymore. We we don't have uh, someone who's like front and center being like my personality is this thing. You can talk to me about it, and I speak for the series. Uh, so it's cool that uh, Yuji Hori can uh, can be that and do that. Mark, my Z is for Zap, the spell from Dragon Quest that uh, hits everyone with some energy or whatever. Um, I love that anytime you play a new RPG series, you have to learn like a new set of like words and being like, what, what, what is it? What, what does the vocabulary mean here? Um, and you know, Final Fantasy, I, I always felt like it was intuitive and obvious, but I think it's also because I grew up with it, but like, yeah, what does cure do? It, it brings back my hit points. What does fire do? It casts fire magic. And does, is that uh, complicated by Fira and Firaga? Absolutely. Um, but zap, Zap is the name of a spell. Incredible. Uh, my Z is Zidane. Zidane, the main character from Final Fantasy IX. Can you tell I really like Final we Fantasy tell. IX? Another thing, but not every part of it, though. But not every, <laughs> not every part. That's true. Um, every rose has its thorns. Zidane, not that thorn though. One thing that I've always liked about it is he's, for the most part. Just your normal average human, except he has a pre- prehensile tail. Does have a tail. And it's never like, it's not a plot point. It's never really explained. It's not like important, you know, like what his species is or what's going on. It's just yeah. part of who he is. Um, It is, uh, I, I do like, uh, especially Zidane is like uh, half of the, the love story there. Um, I do think it's interesting that like this is kind of during the arc when Final Fantasy is doing more love stories. Um, not that they aren't present in earlier games, um, but like even the love stories in like six and seven are sort of like background to what's really going on in the games in nine and 10. Like, I feel like they are front and very center. central. Yeah. Um, and Zidane is a good, uh, he's, he's a good foil for like, I mean, it's sort of a classic thing, right? Of like, here's the 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 thief, no good uh, scoundrel, the, and the princess. It's Han yeah, Solo and, and Leia. Absolutely, yeah. and he's so he's so much a swashbuckler. Yeah. But I, you know, I think one of the reasons I like Final Fantasy IX so much is because it is that um, Indiana Jones: The Last Crusade. Like, let's we're let's gonna, just we're gonna do get it the, all again. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. get the gang back together, and we're just gonna do classic Final Fantasy. Right. And we're that's what Final Fantasy IX right. is. Yeah. Ugh. Let's play Final Fantasy IX. <laughs> All right, Mark, that was A to Z. Let's close this out. That is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. If you have your own A's or B's or C's of uh, Square Enix, you can hit us up on Twitter or uh, a, in, you can email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. I'm sure we will be discussing this in the Discord um, tomorrow and for uh, so, some time. So get at us there. Let us know what you thought. Anything that we weighted too heavily, something we didn't mention that we should have, we would like to know. Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like this episode, episode share it on Facebook or Twitter or any old place where you can share stuff. Uh, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MK Mitchell. And the show is at Nincart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Anthony DeLuca made our logo and our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. From my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening.